the Nintendo Switch kinda sucks, and I'm prepared to defend that statement. I'm nothing if not well-versed in people being angry at me on the internet, and I know I can't just say a thing like this without people hippity-hopping their way up to my door to tell me how I'm an idiot. I want nothing more than the ability to respond to that guy with a timestamp, so we're going to go in depth. Buckle in and let's really deep dive why exactly the Nintendo Switch kind of sucks, and why Nintendo kind of sucks too. Hardware is obviously a hugely visible part of the Switch. For a lot of people, it's hard to divorce the Switch from well, the actual handheld. And so when I say there are issues with the Switch, most people will immediately think there are issues with the hardware. Let's start there, because there are issues with the hardware. A lot of issues with the hardware. In fact, the most famous, or I suppose infamous, hardware problem is Joy-Con Drift. It's probable that this is the tentpole issue that sums up the hardware concerns for most people. Drift means that the controller is making inputs without being physically moved. So as you're playing, the joystick moves and your character does something you didn't intend. That's not a huge issue necessarily. It can certainly be frustrating, and there are definitely reports of it making some consoles nearly unusable. But you can solve this issue. You can use other controllers or even use the Pro Controller, and ever since Kotaku put together a report about the issue, Nintendo has at least repaired the controllers for free or replace them, whatever their internal system is. They haven't admitted there is a problem, but if you go to them with this problem, they will fix it. It's a bummer if you have the issue, but it can be solved. The Switch is hardly the first console to have hardware issues at launch, and companies like Microsoft and Sony have shown a very tried and true method of handling these issues. This would be a lot more respectable if the issue went away, if Nintendo had followed those trailblazers. It hasn't. The Nintendo Switch came out in 2017, and it's been refreshed at least once, but this Joy-Con issue still persists. It's still a modern problem, and Nintendo didn't move quickly to address it. It took them over two years before they issued refunds and started repairing them for free. Worse, they didn't do it because they wanted to repair their products. They did it because of a class action lawsuit and terrible press. It's a big enough issue that there are at least two class action lawsuits filed against Nintendo. So the question at hand is, since they haven't fixed this problem and it still occurs, is this problem with the controller something that can't be easily fixed? whether due to engineering or perhaps sourcing problems. And if so, will that eventually affect the Switch Lite, which means replacing the entire handheld? Unfortunately, yes, it has already begun affecting Switch Lights. This is an issue that started very small, was disregarded by Nintendo until it was forced to be acknowledged, and only then did they start to fix it. And they did it in such a way that the next generation they released is now experiencing the exact same problem, but in a way that literally bricks the console. A lot of the hardware issues are small things that mount up to become huge. For example, in what can only be called obviously, the Switch dock can damage the screen of the handheld, meaning that you're basically forced to pick up a screen protector for your console if you don't want to have it damaged by itself. The Joy-Cons, besides drift, in some games will occasionally just disconnect, which isn't a huge problem if you're not in a fast-paced game, but not all Nintendo games are Mario. 
Both of these are basic design flaws, the dock having issues scratching the screen and the Bluetooth antenna being in a suboptimal location. Then consider that having a piece of hardware running for a long time means heat. And what happens when you keep lots of heat in a small plastic container? Over time, the console itself can kind of bend or warp. And the casing is known to develop cracks and the screen to develop dead pixels. And let me promise you that while it may sound like nothing, a bright green pixel in the middle of a cutscene is distracting. Never mind, of course, that sometimes your Switch can just be possessed by the demon of Wally. These are all minor but present issues. You may experience none of them, or you may experience all of them. Some are really simple, very basic design flaws, and some are inevitably caused by wear and tear. Some are outside of Nintendo's control, but most of them are in Nintendo's wheelhouse. This is the company that famously required the Nintendo DS to be dropped from about six feet 10 times in a row without fail. The company of Nintendium. The Wii was stress tested to hold 180 pounds of pressure. They would throw prototypes at walls to ensure durability and refine their products so heavily around being nearly indestructible. Yet, not so with the Switch. Now, I won't go in on Nintendo for things like the short battery life, because it makes sense that something with this kind of power isn't mobile for very long. And in fact, Nintendo has taken steps to increase the battery in later models. Nor will I take a stab at the cost of storage. It's not necessarily their fault for making internal storage so tight, when they probably didn't expect storage to suddenly become expensive, and when external SD card storage is incredibly cheap. But you want to know something I will go in on Nintendo for? Why, for God's sake, is the Switch's Wi-Fi card the worst that's ever been in a console? And let me say, that includes the consoles that didn't have one. It is atrocious, and because of this, you need to use wired internet. That's not a huge problem, sure, okay, except that there isn't an ethernet port on the switch dock like it it just doesn't exist because for whatever reason in today's world nintendo apparently wasn't thinking about online connectivity and so you as the consumer your best solution is to buy a third-party Ethernet adapter in order to have a solid online experience. While many people think of Joy-Con drift, this is, to me, the actual tentpole of Nintendo's hardware experience. A feeling of mistaken cheapness. Most times, it's forgivable. We all know that Nintendo is famous for their lateral thinking with withered technology. This quote, attributable to Gunpei Yokoi, the designer who invented the Game Boy and the D-pad, is incredibly ingrained into Nintendo's modern way of thinking. They take withered technology, things that are older and cheaper and away from the leading edge, and they use this in new ways, the lateral thinking part of that quote. And it's why they have such fascinating releases. The Switch is a very unique console, and the Wii and Wii U were very unique. And lateral product movements is how you get mind-blowing new concepts. Attacking an existing product with orthogonality means that you are able to throw out all the preconceptions, all assumptions, and cross-pollinate until you've created something truly revolutionary. Nintendo does this, and they've done it repeatedly. It is a core pillar of their brand, of their philosophy, and it's a successful pillar as well. Arguably, if they just made another PlayStation or another Xbox, they would fail. But because they make a Switch and a Wii, they succeed marvelously. However, I think this has failed them here specifically. The Switch is 
withered technology. It's cheaper pre-existing tech that is well understood, requires no special anything, and just needs to be put together in a unique way. But because of that, it's also older, it's cheaper, it's less effective. This is what leads to a Wi-Fi card that doesn't work. It's what leads to Joy-Cons that disconnect or drift. It's what leads to warping consoles and cracking cases and dead pixels. Certainly it's profitable, but it's also cheap. This cheapness does them a further disservice because of how third-party developers have to hobble their own games to play on the Switch, or find really innovative methods to completely circumvent the obstacle of the Switch entirely. But I worry more about its ability to bottleneck the industry. Games like Hitman and Control use cloud-based services because Switch users will otherwise have a very bad experience. And frankly, even with streaming the games, it's likely that unless that Switch has an Ethernet adapter, well, they're still going to have a suboptimal experience. But at least streaming allows for the developers to not have to take the Switch's degraded hardware into consideration during development. My problem here is that there's a possibility that because games take the Switch into consideration, they are less. See, you can build a game to take advantage of the more powerful processing and faster loading and coolest features of the newest hardware in consoles and PC, but you can't build that game with those at the core, with them at the heart. At least not if you want to also have the game play on Switch. This already is an issue that can be seen in both small and large examples across the development pipeline when it comes to hardware discrepancies, and the power differential is just going to get even wider now. This is fine in some moderation, but the issue would be if the Switch became the industry standard lowest common denominator. Because then, why bother making a game that takes advantage of newer hardware when you can make it run well on the lowest common denominator, the Switch, and know it will work fine on its contemporaries anyway? Part two of the Switch is software, and it's completely separate from the hardware with regards to the issues at hand. See, the software from Nintendo is so highly regarded that it is what allows the shoddy cheap hardware to sell at all. I often think about what would happen if Nintendo became a software company instead of a hardware company, if they just released Super Mario onto other platforms like Sega does with Sonic. And frankly, I think they'd still be incredibly successful, perhaps even more so, because the software is king. Mario, Pokemon, Animal Crossing, Zelda, Smash, these are huge franchises that define entire generations' gaming experiences. Yet, Nintendo makes incredibly weird decisions when it comes to their software. And for this, I'd like to focus on just a few games, because these are indicative of the kind of problems you see in most Nintendo software. Pokemon Sword and Shield is a disaster that should never have befallen the single biggest franchise in media history. To reiterate, the largest franchise in media history. Pokemon has generated over $100 billion in revenue. It is the highest grossing media franchise ever, despite only existing for a quarter century, and it looks like garbage. The online is barely functional. You'll notice this is a recurring theme. And they cut out half of the Pokemon in a series about catching them all. I know, Pokemon issues seem a bit dead horsey, but the problem is that there's a consensus that it's fine because it's Pokemon, and a lot of excuses about how it's not Nintendo's fault. But let's be honest, it's not 100% Nintendo's fault, but they own Pokemon even if they don't outright 
own it. As a comparison, look at Yokai Watch. This is a Pokemon styled series by Level 5 that, on the Switch and the 3DS, Nintendo's own hardware looks better and has more Pokemon than Pokemon, despite only being a thing for like five years now. Comparatively, a super low budget game that has completely surpassed Pokemon within three games while also being half Persona, half Yakuza, on top of being Pokemon. So Pokemon has no excuse, even though it's been hand-waved away. Splatoon 2, at launch, had a single-frame heartbeat. If your connection wavered for even a single frame, you got disconnected from the game and punished for it. Eventually, that was fixed, but then... When you get into a lobby, well, if you want to change your guns, you need to leave the lobby, even with friends. You'd have to leave a lobby, switch your guns, which in Splatoon 2 are more like your classes, then hope you could rejoin after the next match. Or you'd all have to leave and hope that you all join a lobby before the game started. And this is not a huge problem either. It's fine enough for the game's pace, but it would stop you from playing, period, if you wanted to switch. See, it's not that the lobby system in Splatoon 2 is, in and of itself, particularly damning, but it is indicative of the kind of online ineptitude inherent in Nintendo's software. In Super Mario Maker 2, the online was not only awful, but for the first few months, you could only play co-op with strangers, not friends. And the only game Nintendo has ever made that has rollback netcode, a really standard thing in online multiplayer, is ARMS, which is dead. This presents a really sucky problem. Nintendo's first-party single-player games are basically the golden example of playtested and perfected. There are tiny details and loving care in every single sound, animation, even the frequency and duration of the rumbles in the controllers. Bomb fuses in Breath of the Wild go out in the rain. Every Smash character has a feeling and vibe in their movements and animation that is entirely authentic and entirely their own. Mario will spin a different direction depending on whether you flick the right Joy-Con or the left one. The tiny details are obsessed over. The sound effects are unique and perfectly crafted. And then you go online and the whole thing breaks down because they didn't think you'd want to play the game with friends. This brings me to the third part of Nintendo's problems, and it's a problem with Nintendo first and foremost. Let's just say that I've covered Nintendo's complete lack, as in zero, comprehension of online infrastructure in the software section, and instead, let's focus on the problem with Nintendo and their policies. I'm sure we all remember not too long ago when you couldn't show Nintendo games on your YouTube channel, or else, they would content ID claim your videos for using Nintendo games. If you wanted to monetize your Nintendo videos, you needed to be in the Nintendo Partner Program, which meant that you basically agreed not to say mean things about Nintendo. They got part of your revenue, they could approve or reject videos, and you would only cover Nintendo games. This was during their single worst performing era ever, the Wii U, when they were less relevant to the zeitgeist than they'd been since 1983. Now, eventually, after basically all of YouTube decided they would just not cover Nintendo games anymore, this policy was dropped. But it's that kind of backwards, nonsensical thinking that shows up all over Nintendo. Let's just start with the big one. Every generation, the storefront changes. If you don't use the Nintendo Store, you probably don't understand that. So let me explain as simply as possible. When you open the PlayStation Store or the Xbox Store, or on your PC you use Steam, that storefront is available whether you are on a PS3 or a PS5, or an Xbox 360, or an Xbox Series X, or a PC. On 
Nintendo, however, every single piece of hardware has its own separate storefront. That means that you, as the consumer, have no real reason to trust that Nintendo won't eventually delist all of your games or shut down the store. This has happened before. The Wii Shop is gone. The DS Eyewear Store is gone. The Wii U and 3DS eShops are separate from the Switch Shop. Every generation, the store changes completely, meaning you have no guarantee of keeping your download history, your purchase history, ever. This leads to you, as the consumer, being forced to buy a re-released Wii U game at the full price of $60, which is definitely frustrating, because, you know, they're like seven-year-old games. And if you think you can just go back and grab the original Wii U version, no. They often delist those games when they come to Switch. This, of course, is incredibly anti-consumer, but even then you can kind of, sort of understand how it might happen. But imagine if all your PS4 purchases were just gone because the store was shut down. And it's not like Nintendo is a small company that can't afford to keep a revenue-generating website online. They have more money as just a games company than the entirety of Sony, an incredible amount of cash on hand. And yet they just do it because reasons. This plays into the fact that Nintendo is essentially unwilling to take inspiration from outside their own little bubble. This is normally a strength. It's why they're able to make such unique hardware from their orthogonal thinking. It's why their games are so incredibly sought after. It's also why their Wi-Fi cards are cheap and flawed. Now, I mentioned the Switch eShop, but it has its own problems too, and I don't think any Nintendo fan wouldn't agree that it's essentially the worst storefront any system has ever had for two reasons. One, there are no sorting options. Like, there are hundreds of games added every week, not an exaggeration, and you can't find anything on the store if you want to browse. And two, Nintendo lets anything on their store. The sales page is eight to nine pages long of terabad one dollar indie games priced down to 25 cents. And dozens of Unity PlayStation Plus games that weren't even worth being free that end up as deluxe editions on Switch at nine dollars a pop. And this just feeds directly back into the inability to sort or properly browse, because now you've got to swim through dozens of awful shovelware games to even see if there are any new games. It's completely choked out any legitimate indie titles on the service. And God, how can a company that obsesses over the kind of bell tones in a game also allow this to be the user experience on their premium hardware. A friend of mine works with a lot of Nintendo devs, and he has horror stories about how Nintendo will often just go no contact when approached about publishing issues. One example he has is a developer whose game launched improperly and was essentially broken for three weeks because he couldn't reach anyone at Nintendo to fix it. The irony here is that the game launched perfectly in Europe, not because it was launched perfectly, but because the information Nintendo gave him was so bad that the game only launched in the US. So he was able to fix the problems that the European version had. So not only did they give him bad information that led to a broken launch, but they gave him bad information on two different storefronts. And had it been accurate for Europe, the game would have still launched broken. This is after they ghosted this developer after discussing a promo on a Nindy Spotlight video, which very well may have have made this game in what is an often make or break game industry. What do you even say to that? 
Now let's skip a bit outside of the simple problems. Yes, there's hardware issues, there's software issues, there's corporate issues, but what is the problem with the Switch? It's a platform that thrives on being and was perhaps designed to be more affordable for adults and children. It was meant to be the lower priced option, something you could buy as well as your PS5 or Xbox S. But a lot of the highest quality content that Nintendo itself develops rarely, if ever, drops in price. I think Nintendo actually leaves a lot of money on the table from so rarely dropping prices on their titles. A game like ARMS drops to $42 from $60 once in a while. And if you're tuned in enough to be following gaming deal sites, then you might not miss it. However, at that point, you're also likely tuned in enough to know ARMS is probably a more justifiable purchase at $20 or $30, considering that the game is dead, in part thanks to Nintendo's poor support for living games. In part, because why would you spend $60 on a game that's dead? This has been Nintendo's MO for a long time time, so it's not even a Switch-specific issue. But it feels more obvious to me than ever with the Switch's success that they could capitalize on enticing lower-income purchasers by catering to them after a game has been released for a year or two and seen the lion's share of its full-price sales. This is a market pricing scheme known as price skimming, the idea being that you get the largest amount of revenue early on before demand drops and before competitors. Uniquely, Nintendo is almost without competition for its core fan base, and so has essentially disregarded the idea of lowering prices to attract more cost-conscious buyers, because there's no need to remain competitive. Essentially, Nintendo's sales volume doesn't decrease at the highest price, and therefore, they are never forced to lower the price to meet demand. But this is short-sighted. It fascinates me that as a company that banks on introducing its IP to newer generations, that they don't reduce the barriers of entry more past initial launch periods. It may be more immediately beneficial to stand strong at $60 and sell fewer games per year to more casual gaming households, but those are also fewer possible IP interactions. The Switch is the cheapest full platform, tied with the Xbox Series S, and the Switch Lite is the cheapest AAA console ever. However, the Switch is potentially the most expensive long term, depending on how many games from Nintendo you want to play. Then again, Nintendo always manages to find a way to convince you to pay, so this probably isn't actually a problem at all. Speaking of, what's wrong with Nintendo? Nintendo is a weird company that does its own thing, often to the bafflement of anyone paying close attention to them, but it always seems to work out. I could come back to answer this question when I'm 50 and probably still be able to write those exact same words. My answer might be a result of me being too close to see the woods for the trees, but I think they leave their core base frustrated and longing more than they should. That base wants to be able to play the titles they loved growing up, in between new Marios and Zeldas, but those classic titles are either dripping in at a snail's pace in an online subscription many people question, are outright unavailable, or now becoming available for limited times before retreating into the Nintendo vault as unavailable. Regardless of whether this was a mercenary calculation to artificially pressure consumers into buying games like Fire Emblem 1, which, by the way, is a bad game to play in 2021, it's a novelty release at best, or Super Mario 3D all-stars, or whether it's a misguided attempt at a unique anniversary event. The fact is that it feels short-sighted. It's especially odd with a game like Mario, which seems so evergreen. 
But then it's also sold millions of copies, so I'm sure they're happy with that. But they didn't need to put an artificial time limit on Mario to get those sales. If it was just a simple, dumb explanation like physical copies going out of production, it would make a lot of sense. But they pull these games off their digital store as well. Will they eventually do this with other games? Slowly pull games into re-release cycles? Or perhaps it's to allow them to reintroduce the games at varying price ranges without anyone noticing a price increase. Speculation is all we really have. This will very likely have little impact during the Switch era, which is very successful by most metrics for Nintendo. But if this feeling continues, I'm curious how it bodes for Nintendo during a future hardware release that doesn't sell as well. Where is Nintendo if that core base has eroded some and isn't passionate enough to help hold it up? The Wii U feels like a distant memory, but it should be a stark ever-present reminder over Nintendo's head of what can go wrong. Again, those fans just want to buy old games and relive those memories, which is money left on the table for games Nintendo completely owns the rights to. Nintendo is the Disney of gaming, but Disney has so many revenue streams and points of interactions with consumers that they can get away with not having Cinderella or Snow White available at all times. Can Nintendo afford not to have Mario or Smash? As the gaming space seems to be making more confident strides towards becoming fueled by streaming apps accessible from smart TVs, Nintendo keeping its odd duckling routine might risk them not being able to keep up. There's very little for them to fall back on at the moment other than hoping the next hardware also sells. If they keep making products with portable capability, it may not even matter. But what if it were to matter? It's an increasingly odd issue when the Xbox brand is committing to the appearance of long-term backwards compatibility and cross-console ownership despite not having as iconic of a catalog to offer. Within the next few years, we will probably see the Xbox app on any device they can shove it into. $15 a month and you can stream a couple hundred or thousand games with the controller you picked up at Walmart. Amazon will likely follow a similar path. Sony will begrudgingly follow. EA, 2K, and other major publishers might get purchased in a bid to have the best content on each streaming platform. I often forget about Stadia, but let's be blissfully ignorant and say that that will probably keep going too. In that world, where does that leave Nintendo? I'm surprised that Nintendo hasn't looked more at what Microsoft is doing and done more to emulate it with their NES SNES app. Making that a unified and more robustly packed offering and then biting the bullet to get it on phones, TVs, as subscription revenue feels like one of the more certain bets they could make with the potential direction of the industry. It also helps with that earlier frustrated base I mentioned. And if things don't wind up going that way and boxes remain the way to play in the future, then at worst, they've implemented a diversification to their revenue stream for what's not a ton of effort and pleased some fans along the way. Being content to head on their own path has gotten them this far, but sometimes driving with no directions eventually puts you on a dead-end road. I don't know how to fix this, because we just don't know what they're doing internally. They're on their fourth president in six years, after having two for 45? Clearly it's working for now, but that doesn't mean it can't Wii U right back. And I don't think the company is particularly prepared for what would happen if their fan base stopped being willing to take so much. 
It's important to me that this doesn't feel like dunking on a company for no reason. For a stunningly large amount of players, Nintendo is their first interaction with gaming. Mario, Zelda, Pokemon, Animal Crossing, Donkey Kong, Metroid, Duck Hunt. Think back to the very first game you played, and there's an outsized chance that it was one of these franchises. Your first memory of playing a video game is more likely than not on a Nintendo, and that is a remarkably strong bond. It's that bond, that sense of nostalgia, that gives Nintendo the leeway to make these kinds of mistakes once. Or else those players, who are you? by the way, you will eventually start to lose that sense of nostalgic wonder, and instead just view Nintendo as what they currently are. A very mercenary business making a lot of mistakes with some of our most beloved memories. What's the first game you played? Let me know in the comments or hit me up on Twitter. Unlike some YouTubers, I actually respond to comments. If you'd like to watch another video, you can find it in the corner right now. I also feel compelled to give a huge thank you to Kevin from The Golden Bolt, Ryan Dopp from Ryan Dopp, and Chris Mykonos fan from Find the Computer Room, and of course, every single patron and YouTube member. And as always, I'll see you on the next one.